Hello everyone, Helen here. Welcome along to this week's podcast. Whether you've been here lots of times before or whether this is your first time or you're quite new, uh, I would like to say a very big welcome to oh, lots and lots of new viewers and subscribers to my, to my channel. Uh, I've been quite taken aback <laughs> and I've had lots and lots of lovely comments as well. So thank you to anyone who has taken the time to leave a comment. Um, hopefully I haven't missed anybody's comments because I do at least like to acknowledge that I've read your, your comments because I really, really enjoy reading them. Uh, so yeah, and, and if you are quite new, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I live in the northeast of England near the city of Durham and I was a primary school teacher for lots and lots of years and specialised in teaching music, but I just taught all things when I was in school. And uh, then I decided to leave and just concentrate on piano teaching. So I teach from home, all ages, from three to adult, and have a really, really lovely time doing that. But I still have plenty of time for doing all the other things that I love, So, which usually involves making things and uh, also going out to places and I, I love history and finding out about the places that I, that I go to and I love most of all sharing it with you. Um, I found so many of you who love crafts but also love history and just interesting things about places um, that, that we can go to. And one of the things that I really love is going away in the camper van. And uh, yeah, we've we've had this camper van. My, that's my husband, Phil, and I have had this camper van for not quite 18 months as I chat to you today. And oh, we just love it so much. Uh, previously, um, our holiday accommodation was usually a tent. And so this... <laughs> Although this is quite a basic camper van, I suppose, it doesn't have a bathroom and it has a, you know, it has a, a seat that has to be folded out into a bed and things. But for us, it's absolute luxury compared to a tent. You know, I've got a fridge and I've got oh, cupboards. I can make a cup of tea when I want to really easily. So uh, we we really, really love it. And so we've just come back from um, our longest trip yet. I mean, not long by some people's standards. We haven't been away for weeks, but we did go away for 16 days and had a fantastic time up in Scotland. And yeah, I'm looking forward to telling you all about it. And so uh, because there was so much, uh, you know, in 16 days, I'm not going to try and squeeze it into one one podcast. So we've got the first part today and then I'll I'll in the weeks to come, I'll share the, you know, all the other things that we did. So, yeah, uh, I hope you're going to enjoy doing that. So our, our itinerary, if I just give you a brief overview of, of what we were planning. First of all, we were heading for the ferry terminal at Oban and giving ourselves a couple of days to get there. We decided not to go direct and we were really happy to discover all sorts of interesting places along the way. Our next destination was to the isle, islands of Col and then Tyree. And then we planned a, a long detour up to the highlands of Scotland. Oh, that was so great. I can't wait to tell you about that. And then the final part was to visit the Isle of Mull and Iona. And then finishing with a trip to the Ardnamurchan Peninsula. So I've got really lots and lots of things to tell you about and places to take you to. One thing that we've discovered is that when we set off on a trip, it's much better for us to leave in an evening, even if it means just driving for an hour or two. If we wait until the morning, we're not very good at getting away as promptly as we really would like to. We always, oh, I don't know, sometimes it can be approaching lunchtime before we get away. So, so we set off on a Thursday evening and we were heading in a northwesterly direction. The roads were reasonably quiet and the sun was setting as we drove towards Carlisle and it was dark by the time we arrived at our chosen night spot just west of Carlisle, just outside the village of Brough by Sands. We use a website called wildcamping.co.uk to help us find places to stop for the night 
when we're not planning to stay in a campsite, which isn't very often. Um, we knew that we'd be parking not far from a monument, uh, although we had to wait until the morning to see it. We woke on the Friday morning to the sounds of activity right next to the van, and when we looked out, we saw a couple of men fixing a wooden bench onto a plinth, very close to where we'd parked, which was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> However, they were very quick at doing their job and we were able to sit on the bench to eat our breakfast and enjoy the view that had been enclosed in darkness when we'd arrived. It was a lovely quiet spot overlooking a salt marsh by the Solway estuary. Of course, we wanted to go and investigate the monument before we left, so off we went on a walk along a clearly marked path. The salt marshes here have been grazed by cattle since the Cistercian monks first arrived in the early 12th century. The marsh is also home to various birds at different times of the year, migratory swans and geese and ducks. We were intrigued to discover that the monument we were walking to marks the actual spot where King Edward I died on the 7th of July 1307. He'd been on yet another campaign against the Scots, but was struggling with illness, possibly dysentery, and in this barren and lonely setting he died. Apparently, a pile of great stones was left there to mark the very spot of the king's deathbed. And it wasn't until 1685, that's, that's about 380 years later, that a monument was built, and that was replaced in 1803 by the fairly uninspiring one, I have to say, uh, that we see here today. We were fascinated to learn that the king's body was first of all taken to the church in the nearby village of Brough by Sands to lie in state for 10 days. I mean, that must have been quite a surprise for the locals, a remarkable happening for people who would never have expected such a significant event to take place in their humble village. Of course, we couldn't leave the area without visiting St Michael's Church where the king had been laid. The church is on the site of what was once the Roman fort of Abelava in the 3rd century AD. And you can see here on this reconstruction where the church was positioned. Oh, obviously the fort wasn't there when the church was built. <laughs> Much of the church was built in the 12th century using stone taken from the abandoned fort. And a telltale sign is this crisscross pattern on the stone facing. And the stone was also taken from nearby Hadrian's Wall. The church was unusual in that it had a west tower and an east tower. The east tower was originally used as a fortified residence for the priest, although it was reduced in height at a later date. The west tower was built with particularly strong, thick walls, because as well as being part of the church, it was used as a place of refuge for the locals during border raids and warfare including invaders from Scandinavia. A bell in the tower would be rung if those on watch spotted raiders approaching, calling everyone to safety. The animals would be kept in the nave of the church until it was safe for everyone to come out. There was a very friendly local couple in the church when we went inside. It was them who told me the correct pronunciation of the name of the village, Brough by Sands, because it doesn't look like that. <laughs> 
and they gave us all sorts of interesting information about the history of the church as well as a guided tour of all the different stained glass windows in the church, one of which shows uh, King Edward I. It was really strange to think that over 700 years ago, Edward I was lying right here in this little church where I was standing and where the king's court and his heir, the future Edward II, came to pay their respects before the heir was proclaimed king. The funeral cortege then moved south via Carlisle and a chronicle from Lanacost Priory stated, a great crowd accompanied the royal corpse some way on its journey southwards, money and wax being bestowed on the churches past and especially where it rested at night. The king was eventually buried in Westminster Abbey on the 27th of October, three and a half months after he died. The church had an excellent exhibition telling of its history and also the history of the Roman fort where 800 soldiers were garrisoned, including the first known people in Britain who were of North African origin. An excellent BBC documentary by David Olasuga, Black and British, A Forgotten History, came here and a plaque was installed to mark the significance of this location. I was also rather taken by the beautiful wall hanging in the church, which was created by a local school to celebrate the year 2000, showing lots of little pictures of uh, buildings in the village and important events that happened, as well as some of the wildlife. We had a lovely wander through to the other end of the village in search of some lunch. There were quite a number of interesting old buildings, including White Row, a terrace of Clay Dabbins houses, which is a building method peculiar to this area, the Solway area, and involving a mixture of sand, silt and clay and straw, which was layered around a wooden frame or crook. There was a beautiful Georgian house that we passed, and just outside the pub, a bronze statue of King Edward I was placed there in 2007 to celebrate the 700th anniversary of his death. Designed by somebody called Christopher Kelly, it shows the king as he probably would have liked to be remembered, as a vigorous warrior and a powerful king, rather than as a sick old man dying in a remote salt marsh. We had an excellent lunch in the Greyhound Inn, a pub that's been there since the late 18th century and is named after its connection with Lord Lonsdale, who trained greyhounds to take part in coursing competitions. The meal we had was really good. Phil was especially impressed with his steak pie and I enjoyed my Cumberland sausage and it was all served with plentiful vegetables, mashed potato and gravy. Neither of us had room for a dessert. By then, we really did need to continue heading north. We had a fair bit of motorway driving to do until we approached the border into Scotland, although it was pleasant scenery and not overly busy. If you watched last week's podcast, you'll know exactly where we were heading. Two of our extra passengers, Matthew and Rose, had persuaded us that we might like to take a rest at Gretna Green. Neither of us had been there before because most of the time... We try and avoid tourist honeypots, but the pigs were very persuasive. <laughs> it was quite funny that in all the time we were there taking photos, no one came and asked us why we were taking photos of knitted pigs, uh, one of them carrying a little bouquet of roses. Really, it was a lot of fun. And even Phil got in on the act, taking photos at this special location. Uh, some of the photos that I've been showing you were taken by Phil. And there was even an actual real live wedding taking place while we were, we were there. So I hope the happy couple don't mind me sharing their happy day. Gretna Green became famous from the middle of the 18th century after an English marriage law said that anyone under the age of 21 had to have parental consent before they could get married. There was no such law in Scotland, and as Gretna Green was the first village over the border on the western side of England, the blacksmith's shop became the focal point for runaway, underage couples to get married. In the literature of the day, Gretna Green was popularised 
For example, in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, in which the, the character Lydia writes to her friend, My dear Harriet, you will laugh when you know where I am gone, and I cannot help laughing myself at your surprise tomorrow morning as soon as I am missed. I am going to Gretna Green, and if you cannot guess with who, I shall think you a simpleton, for there is but one man in the world I love, and he is an angel. We got on our way again and stopped just outside Glasgow to buy a new kettle for the camper van because we were fed up of the rather metallic taste of our cups of tea with the first kettle that we'd bought. And so far, we've been very pleased with the collapsible kettle that we found, especially as tea tastes like proper tea again. The weather took a turn for the worse as we headed for our overnight location, uh, which was a car park at a little nature reserve just outside the town of Helensborough um, on the southern edge of Loch Lomond. It wasn't the most peaceful spot, being next to a fairly busy road, although the traffic noise had competition from the sound of wind and heavy rain. Despite that, we slept there. Well. The rain continued all through the night. Once we were ready for the day, we drove into Helensborough and did a spot of food shopping at his local supermarket, including the essential selection of cheeses. And then we continued our journey northwards. We passed through a lot of beautiful scenery, but we were mostly seeing it through rain and swishing windscreen wipers. The rain came down heavily as we stopped for a mid-morning cup of tea, apparently at a viewpoint, although all we could see was a, a mist. <laughs> We took a route called the Clyde Sea Lochs route and here's a little sample of our rather rainy drive. Eventually we arrived at the town of Inverary, where we'd planned to find some lunch. It's a beautiful little town, uh, the earliest example of a planned town in Scotland, and it sits on Loch Fyne, which is famous for its fisheries and in particular its oysters. Well, we didn't have oysters for lunch, although we did have some good Scottish food in the George Hotel. I had smoked haddock, leeks and mash with a cheese sauce, and Phil had haggis, neeps and tatties very traditional. The lemon posset that we had for dessert was excellent too. The George Hotel was originally two private houses that were built in 1770 that were bought by the Clark family nearly a hundred years later and converted into the hotel that we see today, which is still in fact run by the same family. The inside is full of character and it felt a bit like a smuggler's den with its original flagstoned floors and exposed stone walls, plus open log fires and a collection of about 300 different whiskies. We wandered around the town for a little while to walk off our lunch. 
The Dukes of Argyle were responsible for the redevelopment of the town in the 1740s, engaging architects John Adam and Robert Milne to redesign the street layout and all the buildings. Tenements such as this street here, called Relief Land, were built for the working classes along with a fine parish church and a pier to aid the herring fishing industry. The author Neil Munro was from Inverary and he wrote a series of short stories called the Parahandy Tales about the exploits of a Clyde Puffer, that's a small steamboat, called the Vital Spark, which we spotted by the pier. As we got on our way again, the sun shone and we enjoyed the lochside route that we took. When we paused in Loch Gilphead for a short break, Phil realised that we were very close to the Crinan Canal, and with both of us being canal lovers, we made a spontaneous detour to visit the canal. The canal was opened in 1801 to provide a shorter, navigable route for sailing and fishing vessels travelling between the Clyde and the Hebridean Islands. It's nine miles, or 14 kilometres long, and it cuts across the centre of the ancient kingdom of Dalriada. It was designed by an engineer called John Rennie, but construction of the canal was beset by several problems over the next few years, and the eminent engineer Thomas Telford was called in to make some essential improvements. There are 15 locks on the canal and seven bridges, in 1847, Queen Victoria and her family took a horse-drawn boat trip along the Crinan Canal, and after that it became known as the Royal Route, attracting lots of visitors, many of them from Glasgow, who, like the Queen, wanted to travel along the canal. In 1866, a red-funnelled steamship called the Linnet replaced the horse-drawn boat, and in the summer months it was always packed with visitors. The ruins of the Linnet's boat shed can still be seen to one side of the canal, standing as a testament to the time when the Crinan Canal was a really big tourist attraction. When we were there, it was very quiet and peaceful, wandering by the banks of the canal, and it was hard to imagine the hustle and bustle of its former days. We had to tear ourselves away from this lovely location, though, because we needed to get a bit closer to Oban by nightfall, so we set off again, driving along by the canal and then taking a very sharp left turn onto one of the rather narrow canal bridges. It actually was quite a tricky manoeuvre. This led us onto an extremely straight road, which is definitely rather unusual for most of uh, your journey through Scotland, uh, where windy roads are much more the norm. We hadn't gone very far when another interesting place caught our attention, a rather impressive prehistoric site, the Netherlagi Standing Stones, which we hadn't even known were there. In fact, the whole area centred around the village of Kilmartin has the highest concentration of prehistoric remains in mainland Scotland. The Netherlagi Stones have been found to line up with the rising sun at midwinter and with the sunset at the spring and autumn equinox. Although we really needed to get on our way, we did take time to wander over to the Standing Stones, and I definitely felt some kind of connection with my ancient ancestors, especially when I laid my hands on one of the stones and ran my fingers over the indentations that were part of the artistic culture of the people who erected those stones, carvings that are often known as cup and ring marks. I was sorry that we couldn't stay at the site any longer and explore the ancient chambered tombs nearby, so it's definitely an area that we want to return to and explore in greater detail. We did pass through the village of Kilmartin as we drove onward. The museum there is supposed to be very good, focusing on the archaeology of the area, so that's another place to add to our list of places to visit in the future. We 
were back on roads with many twists and turns, gradually getting closer to Oban, and that was our destination for the following morning. We stopped in a small lay-by next to a quiet road for the night, about ten miles south of Oban, and we had an early night since we needed to be up early the next day. On the Sunday morning, we had to be in Oban by 6.15 to check in for our first ferry journey of the trip. We packed up speedily and we even just left the bed as it was to sort out once we were in the ferry queue and we set off at about 5.35. Arriving in Oban early on a Sunday morning, everywhere, not surprisingly, was very quiet. The only vehicles on the road seemed to be heading for the ferry terminal, the same as us. So we checked in and we parked in the waiting place and waited until it was time to board the ferry to the Isle of Col. And that's where I'm going to leave it for today. So next time I'm in the camper van, I'll be taking you on the next stage of our trip. So I hope you enjoyed that today. Thank you ever so much for joining me. And until I see you again, keep nice and busy, look after yourself and I'll see you soon. OK, then. Bye.